Hey guys, and welcome to another educational video from Legacy Collectibles. This one is going to be about 1911 Colts. And in fact, I'm going to talk about the first 12 that were ever made. I, I just picked an even dozen. Actually, I think I'm going to talk about 13 and 14 as well. But I'm going to talk about the very earliest of the 1911 Colts. This actually takes us all the way back to 1900. If you think about what was going on in the year 1900, uh, first of all, the Luger, George Luger had invented the Luger, the model 1900 Luger. And in the United States, John Browning had invented the design of the 1900 Colt. Uh, you can see just really quickly here the development of the Colt. You see the 1900. Uh, there's a few design changes for the 1902. And then they came out with the 1903, which had a hammerless version. Uh, st still a really cool pistol. Uh, and the hammer version. So 1903 hammer and the hammerless. Um, and then, of course, there was a 1905 and 1907. All of those productions were relatively low. Some of them went to the commercial market, some of them went to the military, but really not taken off in terms of the sidearm of the U.S. Army. You also know they were doing trials. There were Lugers that were part of the uh, U.S. trials uh, and other European guns, but also two American models were the Savage 1907 uh, in 45 caliber, and then, of course, the 1911 Colt. And spoiler alert, you guys all know that 1911 won the contract for the U.S. Army. So that brings us up to 1911 and the point where I want to talk about this gun. I believe this gun is serial number 11. It is not externally numbered, but it is internally numbered, and the number is just peened on there. We'll show that to you in a little bit. It says 0011. Uh, so I believe this is Colt number 11. And I was thinking about doing this video this morning. I don't know if this ever happens to you, but I woke up at four in the morning. I laid there for about a half an hour. About 4.30, I thought, ah, what the heck? I think I'll do a little research. So I found information about serial numbers one through 12. And I'm here early in the morning after three cups of coffee just to bring you this information. And as you can tell, I'm all jazzed up about it. This is really exciting stuff. So grab a drink. If it's in the morning, get a cup of coffee, have a seat, because I'm gonna take you on a ride. Now, the last video I did, I mentioned uh, these two guns. I said I got two, er uh, two early Colts, and I'm, uh, they were made in 1912, and I'm going to do a separate video on them. Uh, believe it or not, I made a mistake, and actually, I, I say that jokingly because I do make mistakes, and I love it when you guys respectfully uh, correct me. Um, I said they were made in 1912. Uh, to my surprise, most of the guns I ever see when the patent date is 1911, Usually by the time they ramp up and produce the, the gun, it's, it's a, a year later. I found that uh, with a lot of the, the German pistols. Um, but in this case, to my surprise, as I was reading through the book, and um, the book that uh, I used as a reference was The Government Models by William Goddard. It is available on uh, Amazon. Um, it's out of print, but still available. In that book, he actually has the original research and cites uh, letters that went back and forth between Colt and the Springfield Armory in the year uh, 1911. And so actually the first guns were made in February and March of 1911. So the uh, patent date uh, that you see on the slide, and you can, uh, you can see here on the slide that we have a patent date of February 1911, and they were already producing uh, these guns in February of 1911. So what Colt did, and again, the design was by uh, John Browning, um, and uh, just as a side note, I, I will say, you know, I don't want to disparage the Luger because I collect Lugers, absolutely love Lugers, and whenever I s express this opinion, I make somebody mad. Uh, Lugers are beautiful, a lot of moving parts, and fairly expensive. Uh, these early models, um, uh, they pack a punch because obviously 45 caliber, um, and they are fairly simple. Uh, it's a much simpler design, fewer moving parts, and the cost of these early Colts was only $15, actually $14.95 at that time. Uh, as opposed to the Luger, which I, I, I can't, uh, I know in Reichsmarks, but basically it's uh, more moving parts, more things that could go wrong. Again, beautiful gun, great in 9mm, but in my opinion, and let me, let me just say, I only collected Lugers and Walders for almost 30 years before I even started looking at Colts. 
Um, and now I'm really getting into them and I, I realize what a simple design uh, this is. It has advantages and disadvantages. Kudos to John Browning for the design on this gun, also the um, Browning High Powers. So Colt, obviously wanting to get a military contract, that's where the money was. They had been making commercial guns, they had been making some military guns, but just hadn't hit a home run yet. Uh, but th they really thought this was going to be it. The 1911 design, this is it. Um, so they sent six 1911 Colts, numbers one through six, to the Springfield Armory for tests. Now the competition in 1911 had narrowed down to the 1907 Savage. Uh, you can see that here. Uh, it was in 45 caliber and this was used in the uh, final trials. So it was between the Savage and the 1911 Colt. Um, obviously the 1911 Colt um, won the competition. Uh, one excerpt that I read in the book, it said that, um, that, of course, after they had shot 6,000 rounds through every one of these pistols, so one through six, it says what they did is they would, they would shoot 100 rounds in a row uh, from, from this pistol. They would then set it down for five minutes and do the next pistol, shoot 100 rounds through that. They did that one through six, and then they did 100 more and 100 more. They kept doing that to give the barrels a chance to, to cool down a little bit, but they put 6,000 rounds uh, through every one of the guns, one through six, they put 6,000 rounds through the, each of the guns and the savages. And then they took them all apart and they tested them to see which one had the most wear and stress. They said that the savage, after shooting 500 rounds, had the same amount of wear as the Colt at 2,000 rounds. So clearly the Colt was a much better made gun. So after one through six, uh, by the way, uh, one is in question because I, I actually have notes from the book. There is no record of number one. It, it must have been destroyed. Maybe one of the trials was they threw a hand grenade at it and blew it up. But it does say that the factory and the uh, armory have no record of number one. So it doesn't exist. Number two, uh, they've actually put 10,000 rounds through it. Uh, and then this is, this is great. I love This is where I get excited. Number two, they put 10,000 rounds through it. Then they sent it to Rock Island, who used it to, as an, um, a model for the 1911 holster. And so if you, if you look at the early 1911 holsters, they were originally uh, designed and made by Rock Island Armory. And then after that, they sent it back to Springfield, and then Springfield sent it to the printer, who did the design so that they could have a manual on the 1911. So number two was the model for the manual and for the holster. Now, number two is in a private collection today, at least according to the book, and it uh, names the guy uh, Charles, who has it is in his private collection. If he happens to watch this video, could you send us pictures of number two? I'd like to know if it was externally numbered and what condition it's in, but it had 10,000 rounds go through it. Uh, number three was destroyed, does no, no longer exists. Number four is in a museum in Oklahoma. So if you're an Okie, and uh, you know where this museum is. There's a military uh, museum in Oklahoma, and number four is evidently in that museum. We hope it's still there. Number five is in the Springfield Armory Museum. So if you live near Springfield Armory, uh, check it out. See if you can find number five. Send me pictures. And number six, the last of the test guns, number six went to London. Uh, because they also were trying to find a sidearm for the British Army, and the 1911 Colt was in contention for that contract as well. So number six went to London, uh, came back to the United States after, after the, uh, World War I, and is in the same private collection with Charles. Um, I'm not giving his last name because I know you guys will call him up and say, can I come over and see it? Now, you know what comes next? Seven, eight, and nine. This is, even, uh, this is another incredible story. So seven, eight, and nine went to three generals, General Crozier, General Wood, and the Secretary of War, who was General Dickinson. So Crozier, Wood, and Dickinson all got uh, sent seven, eight, and nine as a presentation and a thank you because they were actually on the committee that would help make the decision. Now, just to make sure it wasn't a bribe, I'm sure they had rules about that back then. General Wood actually has a receipt and they have a copy of this in the book. It said, I received um, serial number seven and he paid $15, which was the cost of the gun. He couldn't take it for free, I guess, because it would be considered a bribe. So he kept number seven and receded the $15, but General Wood and General Dickinson sent him back, said, no thank you, I'll pass. Now, just imagine, <laughs> um, there is one on Rock Island right now, um, Rock Island Auction. Uh, you see a picture of it here. It's absolutely beautiful. 
Uh, it is number nine, and there's a lot of research that goes into number nine, and this is the one that went to Dickinson. And remember, he's the guy that sent it back. Now, the estimate is 100,000 to 200,000. So basically, I think it's more valuable than a singer, and these two guys, for the, uh, for the sake of $15, said, I'll pass. You do not want to take stock tips from the two, those two guys. But in a minute, I'm going to tell you who you want to take a stock tip from because they sent it back to the factory. And a junior officer, a guy named Albert Foster Jr., junior officer, uh, he said, I'll give you 15 bucks for him. So he took eight and nine. Now, nine is on auction. I'm sure Albert Foster has passed away. Uh, these guns went on to his family. We're going to hear his name again in just a minute. But Albert Foster bought eight and nine. Nine is on Rock Island auction. You know what? They should pay me a commission for the sales uh, from the sales department. Maybe somebody there is watching. Uh, keep us in mind for corporate sponsorship. Thank you. Uh, number nine is on Rock Island auction um, coming up in about a week. So starting with number 10, that one actually went to uh, London, again, for trials by the British Army. So 10 went to London. I'm sure it was not marked U.S. Army. But there was an order from, uh, from the government that they wanted, and if you look at uh, what I call number 11, um, on the right-hand side, you can see, uh, first of all, let's, let's just take a minute and check this gun out. Uh, it does have the early style grips. There's actually 15 checkers between the two diamonds. That's important to people. A lot of minutia there, but I actually did count um, the diamonds. And, uh, and this one comes with a dual tone magazine. Um, however, if I, I, I read in the book that it may not have originally had a dual tone magazine. It would have the lanyard loop, but didn't necessarily have the dual tone because they weren't doing that then. Um, the uh, finish is a, a beautiful, high-polished blue. And then you can see the, what they call the nighter blue, which is that real bright blue. Now, I mentioned in the previous video that they no longer uh, use, uh, they now use a fire blue, but the chemicals used to make the nighter blue were extremely toxic, and so they stopped using that uh, pretty early on. If you look at the logo, you see the stallion with the circle around it. Now, that was only used in 1911 and 1912. Uh, in 1913, it no longer had the circle. Um, and that's just, uh, and also in 1913, if you look at a slide legend from 1913, they added the August of 1913 to the slide legend. But of course, 1911 and 1912 stopped at the 1911 patent date. The parts that were niter blued include the rear sight. You can see, pull the hammer back a little bit, and you can see the hammer. Uh, and then these, these other small parts, including the trigger. This one's worn a bit, uh, but you can see the niter blue. Just a, a stunning-looking gun. And um, I mentioned that number 10 went to London, so it, it was not marked U.S. Army. But starting with number 11, and this is some conjecture on my part, because we can see 9. If you look at the Rock Island auction one, number 9 is not marked uh, model 1911 U.S. Army. But starting at 11 is my conjecture. They mark them all from then on, uh, model 1911 U.S. Army, or so, a few were marked U.S. Navy. But um, from this point on, they were all marked U.S. Army when it was a military contract. Now, the other thing you'll notice about this, not a, it does say U.S. Army, um, but check these out side by side. You can see on the left-hand side, it says United States property. This one does not say that on the frame. The uh, number 11, my number 11, does not say uh, United States property, but it does say 1911 U.S. Army. So now on the right-hand side, you can see model of 1911 U.S. Army, and you see the serial number externally marked. This is actually number 12,000. It was made in 1912. I picked it just because it is military, and they no longer are using the niter blue. Notice the niter blue is not present on the small parts uh, for 1912, but in 1911, this military model, one of the only ones probably in existence that is military and niter blued on the small parts. But here's what's missing. Let's go back to the left-hand side, and you can see the inspector initials on this one from 1912. There are no inspector initials. Now, according to the factory records, um, there are no factory records for 11 and 12. If you go to Colt and request a factory letter, 
they will say there is no record of 11 or 12. And also Springfield Armory has no record of 11 or 12. Given the fact that it says U.S. Army, but there's no inspector proof, again, my conjecture is this was taken off the factory floor. This was the very first military gun made for the military contract. And by the way, the contract was for 30,000 1911 Colts. This is number 11, and it was the first one of the military contracts. That's my conjecture. If you want to disagree, feel free. Just be polite. Um, and obviously, if you have any other facts to prove me wrong, please let me know, because I don't want to uh, continue believing something that's not true. But having been up since 4 o'clock this morning uh, researching this, this number 11, I believe, was the first of 30,000. Uh, 11 and 12 were taken off the factory floor. And somehow, well, we'll get to that later. We're going to take it apart, but um, let's, let's just go a little further. And then I have a, another surprise. So please don't, don't, don't listen to the commercials. Just stay tuned because I got something really exciting about this gun. But let's talk about 13 and 15. So uh, remember Albert Foster, the guy, uh, Albert Foster Jr., the guy that we want to take stock advice from? He bought number 13 and 15 for $15 each. So this guy owns, <laughs> uh, Albert Foster owns eight and nine, 13 and 15. Um, I don't know where his family is, but those guns have to be in a collection somewhere and hopefully someday they will show up. Um, and then there was another 30,000. You can see uh, this one, which is more common uh, that, you know, this is basically what they look like. Uh, this is number 12,000 uh, of the first 30,000 in the contract that went to the United States Army. And just beautiful condition. As I've said in many videos, the first thing to go is the grip straps, and these uh, grip straps are, are uh, really beautiful. This is a phenomenal gun, but no comparison to number 11 in terms of rarity. Now, I said there's one more surprise. Okay, a little background on these three guns. First and foremost, um, please do not contact me and say uh, how much. Uh, these are not for sale. Um, I mentioned that I just recently got uh, involved with Colts, um, never really collected Colts, but since I started Legacy, I knew I needed to learn about Colts because we have a lot of customers who want these. Uh, but I have a couple local people that I go to on a regular basis whenever I get a Colt that I don't understand or I have questions about. And one of the local guys who is a Colt collector, and he's helped me out a lot, uh, he dropped by one day and brought me these three guns and said, these are from my personal collection, and uh, maybe you can do a video on them. And I set them aside and just recently decided, yeah, I think I will. Uh, now, he did mention that number 11 is internally numbered. So I knew that, but I didn't know the significance of number 11 other than it's very early. Uh, he didn't tell me anything other than internally numbered 11. Um, so first, let's take it apart. And it comes actually it comes apart uh, really easily. Some of them, uh, the takedown lever is a little difficult. This one just popped right off, uh, so easy to take apart. Uh, we then look at the uh, frame, and if you look down inside the channel of the frame, uh, you can see, and it's peened in by hand. So it was not machine numbered. It's peened in. I think you can see what I mean. Um, and it's, uh, uh, what I get is 0011. Now, that could be conjecture on my part, but I, due to all the factors that I've already talked about, uh, this was made in 1911. Um, this is military marked and yet uh, no inspection stamp. Um, I believe this is gun number 11, uh, 0011. Also, if we look at the barrel, it does have, and the back of the barrel, it has the sideway the sideway H, uh, which is the first military variation. According to the book, it has a high polish finish, but the back of the um, barrel is like a milled finish, uh, and a dull milled finish, and that's exactly what this barrel looks like. But now imagine my surprise. I couldn't, I had a really difficult time getting the grip off. So when I took off the left grip, and again, uh, on there really tight, I thought, oh crap, <laughs> somebody carved their initials into it. Uh, but I think that turned out to be a good thing. Um, it, you probably have to turn it on a little bit of an angle, but at the top it's, it's FSB. So I don't know what that means. Then I see Bakersfield, and then I see Bowden. 
So I, I Googled uh, FSB Bakersfield, FSB Bowden, um, and this helped me out a little bit. Uh, when I turn the grip over, I can see F.S. Bowden, Bakersfield. All right, so now it's making a little more sense. I'm on a journey of discovery, don't you know? Uh, they did call me the, the cult detective in one of our videos. Alrighty then. So I Googled F.S. Bowden, and lo and behold, I'm sure I found the guy. Uh, first of all, F.S. always went by F.S. Bowden. His name was Fred Scott Bowden. Uh, when this gun was made, he was already 30 years old. He was a master mechanic. Uh, and he lived in Bakersfield, California. I can't say he was the first owner in less. Um, before the age of 30, he was a, a mechanic working for Springfield Armory. I doubt it. I believe that whoever got this gun got it from the Springfield Armory, and then F.S. Bowden either bought it or ran across this guy, or they crossed paths later on. Um, but I believe he owned it uh, when he was a councilman, in, 19, in the late 30s, I think he looks like a tough guy, and I could see him carrying a 1911 45 caliber as a carry piece. He was a councilman for many years in Bakersfield, and he, uh, in 1941, he was mayor of the town. There was very little information, so he didn't have an outstanding career. I even looked through newspaper clippings and articles. Um, uh, I do believe that he got it either from the factory or someone who worked at the factory. Um, and that he carried it when he was a councilman and the mayor of the town. Uh, how it got to my friend, I'll, I'll, I'll quiz him a little bit more, but I, I believe a lot of this information is a surprise to him. It was a big surprise to me. Hey, thanks for watching, you guys. I hope you had as much fun with this as I did. I still have a lot to learn, so please visit the museums. Give me some information. If you happen to know uh, more about these early cults, please let me know. Uh, if you own one that is as early as these, please let us know. We'd like to share with other people. Make sure you like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, and also consider our Patreon program. There's a link below. I think it's time for me to go take a nap.